Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and may I say welcome to the New Hope Baptist Church of Memphis. My name is Robert Matthews. I am the senior pastor. You are in for a wonderful, wonderful message, wealth of information tonight. So we pray that you would pay attention, very attentive to what is going to be said because it's going to help you down the road. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health even as thy soul prosper. Let's pray. Eternal God, our Father, we bless, praise, and magnify your wonderful name this day and every day. And as we celebrate you, we pray, dear God, that bless your name, blessing your name, blesses us in the process. And we come right now as we're trying to help people as they go from day to day. Give us the courage, the wisdom, and the know-how to do that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our panel for this evening will be presented. Good evening and welcome to Safety for All Seasons here at New Hope Baptist Church, located at 2356 Elvis Presley Boulevard, where Robert J. Matthews is the senior pastor. This seminar is to provide you with practical tips to help keep you safe. To enlighten us are five individuals, all with varying careers in law enforcement. Now let me introduce you to our distinguished panel. Our moderator, Barbara Farmer Tolbert, for more than a decade, Barbara Farmer Tobert diligently served as a detective. Her most recent assignment was the Special Victims Unit. She's the first woman to be awarded top cop in Shelby County and also the first African-American woman to graduate with the highest GPA from the Shelby County Sheriff's Office Academy. Now a retired SVU detective, Barbara continues to speak on platforms both nationally and internationally, addressing topics such as sex trafficking, domestic assault awareness, and bullying. She is the pastor of missions at New Hope Baptist Church under the leadership of senior pastor Robert J. Matthews. She is passionate about missions work and has traveled to more than 75 countries. She is also the founder and CEO of Tolbert's Transformational Services, LLC. Panelist, retired Deputy Chief Edwin Henderson. He can boast of a 34-year career with the MPD, which he joined on March 31, 1975, and retired from on August 9, 2009, as Deputy Chief. During his tenure, he commanded several units such as homicide, organized crime, auto theft, planning and research, and crime prevention. He's also credited with formalizing the Neighborhood Watch Program. His personal achievements with the MPD are receiving the Life Service Medal and the Service Medal. He says his seven years in internal affairs was his most memorable. Here at New Hope, he is a deacon and he is the director of Christian Education. Panelists retired Deputy Chief Gerald Perry is a native Memphian who graduated from Carver High School, attended Tennessee State University, and earned a Bachelor's of Science degree from Crichton College. On July 14, 1984, Deputy Chief Gerald Perry joined the ranks of the Memphis Police Department. He began as a patrolman and was promoted to the rank of Sergeant in 96, Lieutenant in 2012, Major in 2008, Colonel in 2010, and appointed to the rank of Deputy Chief in February of 2012, assigned to the Uniform Patrol Division, District 2. Throughout his 30 years of service, Chief Perry worked at the Police Training Academy, Uniform Patrol, Investigative Services, DARE slash GREAT, and Executive Administration. Here at New Hope, he's also a member of our Deacon Board.
Panelist D. Terry Yarbrough, also known as Denver T. Yarbrough, started his law enforcement career March 4, 1968, with the Memphis Police Department and resigned 16 years later in good standing on January 9, 1984. On August 12, 1985, he joined the Shelby County Sheriff's Office, from which he retired August 31, 2013 with 28 years of service, earning the rank of captain. Captain Yarbrough was later appointed the chief of police at Mason, Tennessee, from September 12, 2016 to February 21, 2019. After that, he marketed his professional services as a law enforcement consultant. A native Memphian, he graduated from Memphis Hamilton High School and later earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in criminal justice from Lemoyne Owen College. He is a December 1996 graduate of the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia. He believes in stop the killing, drop a dime on crime, safety, respect, and decency are paramount as life matters. Panelist Robert Pfeiffer on September the 16th, 1974, became a member of the Memphis Police Department, of which he served from 1974 to 2008. During this time, he also enrolled in Memphis State University to further his education. In 1981, he married the lovely Audrey McGee, and they have three lovely daughters. Robert progressed through the rank structure of the police department, achieving the rank of captain. He served at several precincts, was in the Metro Narcotics Unit, he was a school security officer, a member of the vice squad, the crime prevention unit, and his last station was the Orange Mound Coact Unit. He was also founder of the Memphis Police Department Boys Choir, organizer of the MPD Police Department Athletic League, an organizer and original member of the Memphis Police Department singing group, The Peacemakers, in which he still performs. In that capacity, here at New Hope, he is also one of the melodious voices of the New Hope Choral Ensemble. Thurman Richardson Jr. is a lieutenant with the Memphis Police Department. Joining the Brotherhood of Law Enforcers in 1997, his record shows 24 years of continual, efficient, and effective service. Advancing through a series of promotions, a journey that began as a probation counselor for the juvenile court system set in motion assignments as a uniform patrol officer, detective with the organized crime unit vice team, organized crime unit drug response team, organized crime unit major violators team, the DEA task force and with the United States Attorney's Office, a sergeant in the Homicide Bureau and his current position as lieutenant at the Memphis Police Department Training Academy. Thurman is also family focused with deep spiritual beliefs. He is also one of the voices of the New Hope Choral Ensemble. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your panel. You are now in the hands of the moderator. Thank you and again, welcome and good evening. Go ahead and give this panel a hand clap, a hand clap and honor them as they are in the house tonight. And we were talking before we came on air, we were talking about how many years between all of us is over 150 years of law enforcement experience on the stage tonight. Go ahead, you can give a clap, yeah, yeah, give a, give a clap. So again, I wanna say welcome to you and so we have all of this experience, knowledge, right here on stage. We have one hour, really about 45 minutes now, to only scratch the surface of this topic on this evening. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start from my immediate left, and each panel panelist will give their brief discussion about what they will bring to the topic on tonight. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to be here. First, let me say something about home spaces. That's why I'll be discussing this evening. Will you get to your home this evening? I want you to stand on the street or even get in your car and ask why you're home. That what you see is what your actual burglar or criminal element will see also. If your shrubbery has a, a, a exceed your window level or block the exit or entrance, then that's the same thing that the, the a burglar is going to use when he says, smile, you're on hand to camera when you, when you least expect it. What we want you to do is trim all of your hedges away from your home so there's no one can hide behind it. Trim, trim it down below the window level so you would actually see them before they see you. If you have fences, we all like our safety or we feel like our security with the big, tall, eight-foot uh, picket fences that we believe is something.
up with uh, some product of our home being our castle with the moats around it with the crocodile swimming. We don't have that. So what we ask you to do is lower those fences so that you will see him before he sees you. Once you get in there, lights. Everyone knows that the criminal element does not like lights. It's, it's awfully mentioned in the Bible. Whereas the evil man doeth lurks in the darkness. We want you to use the lights. When you leave your home, turn the light on. So that once again, you will see him before he sees you. And it will not impact your light gas and robbery bill. That's a great one. But now, when you get to the home, draw down doors and windows. Now you're making yourself a prisoner in the home. What we advise is utilizing hardcore, solid core doors and then having a deadbolt lock, which, it, which requires you to use a key to enter and to exit the door. With that deadbolt lock, we ask you to have about an inch and a half throw on the actual bolt itself. We ask if you are in the home, lock both doors and leave the key near the door. So in case it's fire, you'll be able to exit in a safe manner. Or even if you don't have the water iron windows, you could throw something out of the window and, and, and more or less remove yourself from harm's way at that point in time. When you are in the home, don't answer the door until you're sure who it is. They have a gimmick going now where they will knock and act as if they have your name and they'll call you as if you're related to them. And that's when we relax and we open up the door, same wise with the phone call. But when you're in the home, Keep the, door, keep the keys right by the door. When you leave your home, turn the dead butt on. If you don't, once that criminal element gets inside, he has the key to exit with everything that you have. If he goes through the window and you have that dead butt lock, then he has to take that 65 inch screen TV out that, that window that he came through, which makes it difficult for him. Be acquainted with your neighbors, especially during the holidays when people are going in and out of town on vacation. Let your neighbor, if you trust your neighbor, in which you should get to know your neighbors before you actually show that amount of trust for them, uh, let him know when you're going to be gone and when you're going to come back. The worst thing that you can do is get on Facebook and email and let folk know you're going on vacation. Because now you just invited me to come to your store and do all the shopping at my leisure. And I can take my time doing it. So we ask that the same way that you would handle a business, you do likewise in the home. If a burglar goes into your home, he knows where the jewelry is going to be. That's going to be in the bedroom. He knows where the microwave is going to be. It's in the kitchen. Because we have our home set up just as you would have a department store. We ask you to put serial numbers and keep it, in, keep it with you. It will assist you also with your insurance claims when you decide to try to get reimbursed for the loss. Family members. When, when you have a family member that's not at home, but they're headed home, have them give you a call to let you know that they're in route. Likewise, when you get home after dropping off all of the gifts that you've dropped off and you, you dropped off the last paper of a person in your vehicle, give them a call and let them know that you've made it home. Time span is what we're talking about as it relates to crime. If by chance no one knows where you were, then the police doesn't know where to stop. So those are the basic things, observation, documentation, and notification. I write down what you see. If it looks suspicious, notify the police and give them a view as to what's going on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Captain Yarbrough. Good evening. I'm Terry Yarbrough. have seen a lot of crime and I'm sure you have too and of course we all have our ways and means by which to deal with it and we all have our personal perspectives on <clears throat> what the police is all about and, and of course um, that's a very sensitive area and my presentation will focus on traffic stops, and interpersonal contacts involving police interactions, other drivers, vehicles, and you. And I'm sure that I will uh, 
arouse some sensitivity here uh, when you mention the police. However, the question is that I challenge you with and, and I ask you to ponder, how do you avoid unfortunate outcomes when you interact with the police or when you are driving on the expressway? Are you susceptible to road rage, so forth and so on? Those are some things that I will engage tonight your actions should be predicated on the following. I have four areas that I would like to entertain you with. The first one being safety. Think about that, safety. How do you avoid unfortunate outcomes? Common, the second one is common sense. Do we always use common sense? Does the police always use common sense? We'll talk about that. Courtesy. Are we always courteous? Uh, how do you avoid unfortunate outcomes? Respect. Do we always respect our neighbor? Do we always respect the other driver? Last but least, not least, do we always respect the police? I can answer that for you. The answer is no. Adjust your attitude. <clears throat> We're going to talk about attitude. And I challenge you to adjust your attitude. If it is applicable, give other drivers and other people the benefit of the doubt. Many mistakes, folks, are unintentional and not meant as a personal offense. Consider whether responding aggressively or angrily is worth being injured or killed. Give that some thought. But all of this is predicated on your safety. Brothers and sisters, I challenge you, think about, think about it. Life matters. I repeat, life matters. Thank you. Again, this is going to be some heavy information given very quickly tonight. So those of you who are here, if you have some paper, jot down your questions because you're going to forget it because you're going to have so much more information thrown at you. And also online, if you have questions, please feel free to put the questions online and we will answer them as time permits. Deputy Chief Henderson. Thank you so much. I'll be talking to you this evening about scams, alerts, and fraud. Very applicable to this season and this time of the year because this is the time of year where we have a lot of scams and a great deal of fraud. So I'm going to be focusing on that. Um, how many scams are there? Far too many to mention. The Bible tells us that there are those who go to bed at night, and while they're lying in bed and they're yet awake, they're thinking and scheming and devising ways to steal and take and trick you out of your hard-earned cash. I'm going to piggyback on what uh, Mr. Yarbrough said. We'll have to take a common sense approach to scams and fraud. I would venture to say that everyone in here has been touched by a scam or fraud at some point in time in your life. You might have had any contact with anyone, but this charge showed up on your credit card that you knew nothing about. So we'll, we'll, we'll touch on those things. We'll talk about how people try to get money out of you to support various charities, some of which you've never heard of. Uh, we'll talk about how uh, you can avoid setting yourself up in situations where uh, you receive merchandise that uh, you really don't want to have. 
and you waste your hard-earned money on getting it, only to lose it all. We're also going to focus on uh, briefly on how to look at and what to do with your documentation. Uh, and that is documents that we generally tend to just discard at leisure. You don't want to do that. And we'll tell you what you really need to do. So the whole idea behind preventing scam and fraud, you've got to use a common sense approach to it. And we'll focus on that shortly. Thank you. Deputy Chief Perry. Good evening. My topic will be uh, safety tips for the season when you're out shopping. And one thing that I want to impress upon you is don't be a victim. And you don't have to be a victim. Uh, the first thing that you need to do is you need to get in the mindset of personal safety. You need to be alert and not distracted. Always be aware of your surroundings when you're driving and when you're walking to the store. Uh, you have to be mindful of, if you're inside a mall, there could be an active shooter and there are stampedes, all of these kind of things you have to be aware of. Uh, if you've got small kids, what you want to keep your eye on your small kids and never leave them unattended in a vehicle. Uh, carry a credit card if you can and it's least amount of cash as possible. Uh, you have criminals out here, that's, that's all they do is they just get out and uh, look for victims. Uh, for ladies, try to avoid carrying large handbags. I know the, uh, what is the Dooney Burton, I'd have bought enough of them, so I don't know what the name of them is, but <laughs> the big purses, you know, try to be, uh, leave those at home, because that's just a target for a thief to snatch it off your arm. If you don't have any money in it, they can sell it. And when you're out shopping, always team up with a friend. When you're out there, it's, it's two, four, four, two sets of eyes are better than one. Uh, and if possible, please avoid being out after dark. You know, uh, I try my best and I got a, a pistol with me, so I try not to be out after dark anyway. And, uh, and I want to impress upon you, uh, do not make any unnecessary stops. Please don't stop at the gas station. You know, have enough gas before you go. And get your gas early. Always let somebody know what your itinerary is because in the event that something does happen, at least we can start backtracking and find out where you were and where you were supposed to be going. Uh, Stay off the cell phone when you're walking back and forth to your car because you're distracted. I don't know if you're texting, you're talking, or whatever. And you got people out there that's hunting you. Criminals are hunting you, so you have to be aware. And uh, if you got your gifts, store your gifts in the trunk of the car or have them covered up. And when you're traveling on the streets, always kind of monitor your rearview mirror. So that, especially if you came from the store and made large purchases, you want to monitor that rear view mirror and make sure that nobody is following you. Now, if you are sure that you are being followed, because it does happen, don't go home. That's the last thing you want to do. Because now that person knows where you live at. So if, if you're sure you're being stalked or followed, what you need to do is you need to get on the telephone uh, call the police, let them know what's going on with you, and then drive to the uh, nearest police station. And uh, those officers will be glad to, glad to make sure that you get home safely. And I, I want to stress upon you, too, if you get out, do it early, early in the mornings. You know, and that way, that's the best shopping time. And uh, most criminals probably sleep by that time of the morning anyway. So you can get your stuff and it'll wake up till later in the day. By the time they wake up, you'll be back at home. So those are just some of the tips that I wanted to offer for you when you're out shopping to be safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Lieutenant Richardson. Again, I'm Lieutenant Thurman Richardson. And my, the topic that I will be speaking upon will be active shooters uh, situation. Uh, far too many times 
here recently, locally and abroad, we have a common place now for active shooting situations. For those individuals who don't know what an active shooter situation is, that's when you find yourself, whether it may be in a grocery store, a departmental store, but out in the public somewhere, even in the church nowadays, and there was an incident that was just captured here in Middle Tennessee a couple of weeks ago, where they had a, uh, an armed individual and where the, uh, the minister, the pastor, had to uh, go ahead and uh, annihilate the threat. But uh, I'm gonna give you real quick uh, three, three steps, three steps as it relates to survive an active shooter situation. The first step, run. Now, uh, I like to add a little comedy to mine because comedy sometimes will make you uh, remember these steps. Uh, some is gonna be funny, some is not gonna be funny. I, I'm not a comedian by trade, I'm a police officer, so uh, my jokes may not be all that well. Uh, so nevertheless, as it relates to run, you've seen a lot of scary moves. Uh, most African Americans, what do we do when we hear gunshots? We run it first and we asking questions later. Always run away from the threat. And when you run, try and focus on running away from the threat and to a place where it provides you two things, a locked uh, room and or cover. And I know that you all probably don't understand what cover is, but in our line of work, there's a difference between cover and concealment. Either one will do, but one is better than the other. Cover is better than concealment. Concealment is that they can't see you but it offers no protection. Cover offers you both. It's, they can't see you, but it also offers you some sort of protection from the round that may come your way in the event that they uh, fire around in your direction. That's run. The second step is hide. You have to hide so that you can make it through this particular situation. If you're running away from the threat and you hide, the hopes is that the threat will be uh, contained and addressed by law enforcement who uh, have been dispatched and on the way. And in the event you hide, please, 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 everybody has a cell phone. The first thing you do when you've got to a place where you think that you've got the best hide spot. Now don't, don't be like y'all were when y'all was kids and y'all playing hide go see. Don't get you a sorry hide space, get you a good hide space so they can't, because can't, can't, this is a life or death situation. All right? So when you hide, the first thing you want to do is you want to put your phone on silent because it'll be my luck. As soon as I get to my hiding space, my phone gonna go off and it's gonna be my wife. You coming home, Sue? Not what you calling me? Look like I'm not gonna make it home ever. Put your phone on silent. Last but not least, in the event that you are faced with the threat, you have to fight. Now, when you fight, and he has a gun or she has a gun, we ain't fighting fair. Whatever you have that's in your, the extension of your hand, you use it. Don't be talking about you gonna hit him in the leg. No ma'am, no sir. Hit him hard with whatever you got and hope, don't hit him with no pillar now. Now if that's all you got, hit him hard with the pillar as many times as you possibly can. But you have to fight. And you cannot stop fighting until that threat is no more. Okay? Mine's gonna be real simple. I came with them under my five minutes. I'm at four minutes and 11 seconds. I timed myself. But run, hide, fight. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. A lot of information. Minister Alter, do we have any questions online? Do we have any questions in the audience? Questions or comments? Okay, we will continue on. Now we're gonna back back to Captain Pfeiffer. So I wanna just um, be the, play the devil's advocate here because I heard you say something about lowering the fence. So let's talk about that. So if a person says, how do I lower my fence? And speak a little bit more on that about what you mean about you, them being able to see the person before the person sees them and why a tall fence may not be 
a safety mechanism like we may believe it is? Well, first off, if by chance you can't see over the fence and the burglar is saved in, in your home, he has the same concealment there that Thurman was talking about. You don't know he's there, which puts you in, in a more or less an emergency situation when you approach him and he sees you before you see, you see him. So we ask you, six, a six-foot fence would be more than sufficient unless you have an animal or something that you're trying to more or less contain. That way you can see anything coming and by chance you're heading home, you can see if there's a dangerous hazard there when you arrive. Thank you. And to Captain Yarbrough, let's talk some more about interpersonal relationships when it comes to civilians and police officers. And just dive in on your expertise. You said, that, and I, I like the word when you use common sense. Sometimes when common sense is not so common. What advice do you have to the public? First and foremost, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's start with the vehicle stop. And let's imagine you are <clears throat> en route someplace. And... Uh, All of a sudden, you see blue lights in your rear view, rear view mirror and rear view window. And you notice that those blue lights are <clears throat> targeting you. The question is, how do you avoid unfortunate outcomes? The first thing we want to do to <clears throat> avoid an unfortunate outcome in reference to just that particular moment I saw or I see blue lights. And most of the time when that happens, and we all know that blue lights represent law enforcement, not red lights, not amber lights, but blue lights, and that's all across the nation except you have some agencies who may have <clears throat> dual lights where it would show blue and red, and some would show blue, red, and amber, but that all depends on the state. But right now, we're dealing with the state of Tennessee. Imagine you, the blue lights. What do you do? How do you avoid a safe outcome? Number one, don't panic. <clears throat> and most of the times when the police pull up behind us, what happens? Our nervous system, it what? It escalates, right or wrong. So how do we control that? Make sure that whatever roadway you are on or whatever thoroughfare you are on, Pull over to the what? Left or right? <clears throat> Pull over to the right. Safely. Do not do it abruptly, but safely. And stop. If you're in a situation where it's dark, you can affect your hazard lights to let the officer know that I recognize that you are behind me, but I'm going to keep moving until I come to what I would consider a safe spot or safe location out of this darkness. And sometimes, here again, as I previously mentioned, common sense. You have to use common sense, and the officer has to use what? Common sense. So we have a dual role here. Both roles have to interact, and they have to cooperate. However, you do have officers with what I call <clears throat> An us versus them mentality. They come to work as if they are going to a war. They consider themselves 
warriors. And that's the wrong mindset. So right away, he or she, they're getting started off on the wrong foot. But your situation is to stay safe. Pull over to the right and stop. Do not get out of your car. Please, do not. There may be a delay before he makes contact with you because most of the times he may be on the radio or waiting for a response from the dispatch because he has run your tags and information will be coming back. And many times the information don't come back, what, timely. So, you know, you just got to be patient just for a few minutes. He'll get out of the car. Do not start looking for your driver's license because you know that that's, that's what he's going to ask you. He's going to ask you for your what? Driver's license? What? Registration? And what else? Insurance. Do not start going in your glove compartment until the officer what tells you to. If I'm in many nights I have been out there <clears throat> in far parts of the county, and I mean dark, pitch black dark. Only somebody out there is me and the other car. No lights, nowhere. Because that's the difference in dealing with these city boys and dealing with the illustrious county police. <laughs> but that's the way it goes, you know. But let me share this with you. It's dark, folks. We are trained strategically to put our spotlight on your rear view mirror. Now what does that do? That blinds you. In some cases, what I have done during my early years, I put my high beams on, I put my spots on, and I put what we call the takedown lights on. I put every light I've got to make sure that you don't what? See me. Many times, strategically, <clears throat> depending on the situation and the contour of the roadway in dealing with the illustrious county policing versus the little old city policing, we will not approach you on your driver's side. We will approach you on your what? Passenger side. Sometimes if, and of course now, most of these cars are what? Solo, what we call riding solo. One man to a car. And late at night, if you get caught at roll call and be assigned by the sergeant, or lieutenant, that you're going to be riding solo, or your partner is not at work, and then you got to hit it. So what you would do is you may get out, and you may shut your door two times. You can't see, but we're going to give you the impression that it's what? Two officers. That is for the officers, what? Safety, because I am what? I'm human. I want to get back home to my what? My family, my wife, to see what she doing. <laughs> I got to get back, folk, because I'm what? I'm human, just like you. You pinch me, it hurts. I pinch you, it hurts. So, think about that. 
how can you avoid an unfortunate outcome? Already, what have I done? I have, for my safety, I'm making sure that you are what? Blinded. I approach you on the driver's side. For your safety, don't be moving around, fumbling, going in your pockets, making furtive moves. Don't go in your glove compartment. Don't do anything. Make sure that your hands are where the officer can what? See them. And the most likely place for that to be is what? On the steering wheel. And we're talking about, I would recommend at a, whatever's comfortable for you, but I would recommend at a 10 and 2 position. 10 o'clock on the left, 2 o'clock on the right. Or whatever is comfortable for you. Some people, depending on their size, arm length, and what have you, or how far they are situated from the steering wheel, you can do a what? Nine and what? What's on the other side? Nine and three. Just relax. Roll your window down. However, if you recognize that that vehicle is a marked police car, then <clears throat> the regular assumption is that it's the police and he's going to get out with a what? A uniform on. But sometimes there are situations where there are unmarked cars out there working. And you don't know whether it's a police because we have what you call impersonators, folk who, who are freaks, police, what we call police freaks, that like to what? Play the role of being a what? Police officer, stopping folk. So what I'm saying is, when he approaches, he's going to ask you, which is wrong, he's not going to ask you anything. He shouldn't. He should be telling you who he is, which is a part of a what? Greeting. And then from that point, the officer should be telling you why. W-H-Y, for his safety, telling you why you are being stopped. And then from that point, <clears throat> he will maybe ad lib to say, did you recognize that you were going that fast or whatever? And then he will get to the point where he'll ask you for your license. Okay, and that's, that's the first phase that I'm going to cover because I don't want to take a lot of time uh, but at the same time, what have I done? I have covered two dimensions of safety for the officer and at the same time for you. Thank you. Captain Yarbrough was actually my commander when I was going through the academy, so now you know why I graduated with a high GPA, right? <laughs> because he didn't leave any leaves unturned. Amen on that. All right, so let's get back to the scams and the frauds on Deputy Chief uh, Henderson and Tell us, what are some ways we can protect ourselves from scams and frauds? Again, a common sense approach. You can be scammed at home. You can be scammed online. You can be scammed on the telephone. But you can be scammed. That's the bottom line. And now the worst case scenario is when you set yourself up to, to be scammed. That's when you go and find a guy that's a street vendor selling stuff out of his trunk and you're looking for that wonderful gift that looks like, smells like, and you want to believe it's just like that high brand, high name item that you've been looking to purchase. But actually it's a knockoff. It's counterfeit. And you spend your hard earned money to buy that knockoff and in less than 30 days it's falling apart 
because you want everybody to think you're carrying a Louis Vuitton and everybody that knows you know you can't afford a Louis Vuitton. So they've already made the decision, oh child, that's a knockoff. You know she can't afford that. So they already know, so you're not fooling anybody. But when you, when you, when you go and make that step, you've opened yourself up to be scammed. You went to them. They didn't come to you. Now, the flip side to that is the person that, uh, that has a showroom and it's in the rear of a vacant duplex on a lot in a certain part of the city and you go there to make a purchase. You know, it's still against the law to buy stolen goods. Y'all do know that, right? So you can set yourself up for failure because you go there thinking you're gonna buy something because somebody told you through your cousin's ex-sister-in-law on your mama's side that you could go there and make a purchase. So you go there to do that and you got your money and what happens? You get robbed. You've been set up, you've been had. So that's just one way where you can set yourself up in, in person. The, the other deal is when you buy items, tightly knit, wrapped up, the box says 60 inch. Magna box, smart TV. And you purchase it, sight unseen. And when you get to wherever, you open it up, and it's a 10 year old TV that you can't even use. But for the sake of satisfying our own pleasures, we fall victim to our own selfish greed, getting something for little or nothing. And when you set yourself up in a situation like that, you know the old saying said, if it sounds too good to be true, y'all finish it for me, y'all know the words. It probably is. Um, it probably is just that. So you have to be careful and mindful of that. And let's talk a little bit about credit cards. Somebody touched on it a while ago, I believe uh, Chief Perry did. Don't carry all your credit cards with you when you go out. If you get robbed, that's four or five credit card companies you gotta contact to let them know your card is in the hands of someone else. Just take the one, just take the one. And when you use your credit card, and let's say, for example, you go to a, a gas station, always be mindful of those electronic spoof devices that cover up the existing uh, card readers on these machines at the gas pump, at the ATM, that spoof your numbers, your credit card numbers, and transmits it to someone else nearby. They got your information. So only use the one. But when you look, make sure that that device has not been put on top of the existing card reader. Make sure that it looks like every other pump that's there. If it does not, go away from that pump, tell the clerk, and go to one that looks more authentic so that they can report that to the police and take custody of that particular spoof reader because it's designed to do one thing, steal your information. When you're online, on the computer, and you do these online surveys, don't participate in it. Because what they do is, they make you feel like your opinion is really valuable. Who told you your opinion really meant that much? To where you get in there and you, after you've answered about five or six questions, then they start getting your personal information, then the next, you know, they want to sell you something. And then before you know it, you come to your senses, hopefully. You've given them more information than you ever intended. But they got all they need. And when you decide to hang up the phone, it's already too late. They're already spending a card in your name. Or making an application somewhere in your name. Or doing something with it in your name because that's what they do.
That's exactly what they do. And the other thing is your billing information. I know sometimes we get bills in the mail and we look at it and we say, I ain't paying them this month. We throw it in the trash. Well, you got scammers that love to go through your trash. They get your information and the bill's got your credit card number on it and off they go. Shred your personal information. Shred it or burn it. But just don't toss it in the trash saying that you will pay it next month because when you get the bill for next month, it's going to be higher because somebody didn't use your card and, them, and had made a purchase on it that she didn't know anything about. The next thing is, when you get your bill, look at it. Look at the charges. Make sure that they are authorized charges that you made. Because somebody in your family may take your card and make an unauthorized charge. You never know. But you need to look at your card and make sure. But check with Honey first. Make sure that uh, before you call the credit card company and say you don't know anything about it, you better, if someone else has a, a card also, you need to check and make sure that they didn't make that purchase also. Because uh, if you get it rescinded and you find out later that they made that charge, you know, you could cause problems with you and your credit card company. Uh, the next thing is when you, when you have those documents that you need to get rid of, you can take them to uh, another financial institution. Some of them will shred them for you. They will do that for you, your credit union. And sometimes uh, you may find other people, uh, even, even your, your church, that may shred some things for you. But don't make a habit of it. But you can take care of that yourself. Don't throw it in the trash. By all means, do not put it in the trash. Now, there are so many scams out there, but that's just a few tips that you can use just to make sure that you don't, uh, you can prevent the ways that you can become a victim of a scam. The, the thing you have to do most is never take the bait. Try to stay as mentally alert as you possibly can. Why is this person befriending me? Why are they being nice to me? I just met them. Why are they telling me about their financial situation? Why are they telling me they just found some money and they want to share it with me? Things like that don't add up. It doesn't make sense. So always let that degree of suspicion be a part of your spirit. And also always pray for wisdom and discernment. So when those people come your way, God will grant you the, 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 the vision to see that you're in a situation where someone means you harm and they're trying to take your money. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Matthews, we are at about 713. Do we have your blessing to continue on for about another 10 minutes? Thank you. Deputy Chief. Would you like to give us some more information about personal safety when you're out? Yes, yes, I will, and I'll be, I'll be brief. <laughs> uh, I wanted to uh, just piggyback on what Ed said about the credit card. And we, I mentioned it earlier, but a good thing is to have a prepaid, a prepaid credit card. Does two things. First of all, it's not your real credit card associated with your bank account because it's prepaid, and uh, you have a limit on it, so you won't overspend. So if you got a prepaid credit card with 500, then when you go shopping, you're not gonna spend a thousand. So just keep that in mind. And uh, also, uh, I wanted to tell you about when you're out parking, trying to find a parking space, and I'm particularly talking to the ladies, uh, try not to park next to a van that has those sliding doors that's right next to your driver's door. You know, when I see those vans like that and I see women pull right up next to it to park, it just it sends chills down my spine because it only takes two or three seconds.
for them to pop that door open, snatch you in that van, speed off, and you go. So even though that park, and it's going to be a good parking spot because it's a trap. So you don't, you, you, you can't catch anybody unless you have a good trap, good, good bait. So just be mindful of those things when you're out uh, shopping. And like I said, you don't have to be a victim. What you have to do is just pay attention. You know, like I said before, criminals are hunters. They, they hunt human beings. And they watch their body language. The body language says a lot about you. And that's what criminals do. They look, they size people up. You know, you do it too. You size people up. He, she looks tough. He, uh, he went, a bag hanging open. All, those, all of those things. They're professionals. So you have to uh, be mindful of those things and, and just don't be a victim. Protect yourself at all times. Thank you. Lieutenant Richardson, wanted to go back and ask about the active shooter. If I have some information and I'm not, not sure but I have some information that someone may have said they're gonna shoot up a particular place. What should a person do? Call the police. Dial nine, not on dial 911, call actually the non-emergency number because at that time it's not an active shooting situation. But as soon as you hear of something that may uh, happen, please call our non-emergency uh, number and I think it's 528-2677. Uh, 528-2677 or 545-CASH. Either way, you'll get into a dispatch that's forward you to the non-emergency line. You give as much details as you possibly can. Make sure you take a, a mental note, get a good description of that particular situation, whether uh, the individual that's uh, making the threat, um, saying that he or she is going to actually uh, shoot at a, a particular place, male, black, female, white, uh, height, weight, what kind of vehicle they're in, closing description. And if you had an opportunity to see the weapon, that as well, because that means a lot. And the reason why it means a lot is because you can't bring a knife to a gunfight. If we know that this individual has what we call a long gun, then that means we're gonna dispatch officers who have the same type of firepower. Thank you. Minister Alter, there's a question online. Yes, ma'am. Angela Pope Lauderdale wants to know, other than marked cars, what other ways can we recognize fake police officers? Okay, I'll take that question. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes we can't, especially at night, but uh, if you feel that you uh, are being approached by a fake police officer, then don't interact. Um, and if you have your cell phone, uh, try to make a call. Don't roll the window down. Keep your door locked. And if you need to pull away, and here again, we're talking about what? Common what? Common sense. Pull away. I'd rather pull away and gamble on that than to gamble whether or not this is a real police officer or not. That's if you feel that. But here again... I hope and pray that, that that will not happen, but it does happen. You know, good question. Uh, so that's my answer to that. Could I add a little bit to that? Also, what, and, and he touched on it, he started to touch on it. You, you can also call the dispatcher. You can advise the dispatcher you are at such, whatever location you are, and there is a police, uh, some blue lights behind me, but it's not a marked car. Is that legitimate? And then they'll dispatch. They'll know who's in the area, and they'll be able to tell you exactly whether or not that is a real police car or not. So you have options because I know everybody has a cell phone. So call a dispatcher, and they'll be able to uh, identify that person on, on the spot. Any questions from the audience? No questions? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Do we have a microphone, please? Hold on, she's gonna get you a microphone, just a second. Y yes, ma'am. When, when there is, when the police car is unmarked, is marked, is unmarked, do, do the off, does the officer always have on a uniform? 
No, not always. <clears throat> Her question is, if the vehicle is unmarked, does the police officer always have on a uniform? No, you do have special details that may be working. However, just uh, <clears throat> sit and wait until the officer gets out. And, and obviously when he comes to your window, uh, he was hoping that he would recognize himself or either roll your window down somewhat and ask him uh, if, if I could see your badge or uh, whatever he may you know, ha have as far as IDing himself. And I'll just add to that. Uh, I did 16 years uh, in undercover or in our plainclothes unit. And we made thousands, literally thousands of stops in unmarked cars. And I'm talking about uh, <laughs> Honda Accords, uh, Magnums. But when I came out of the car, there was something about me that said police, like the badge coming around my neck or the vest that I had on that said police on the front and on the back. There was something that I had that distinguished me as far as being the police. Going right back to uh, uh, retired Je Deputy Chief uh, Perry, what he said, call 911 and they can verify yeah, if that person is the police or not. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, another question. During a traffic stop, I carry a firearm and I have a concealed carry permit. At, one, at what point should I inform that officer that I have a weapon in the vehicle that is loaded and chambered? Okay. Um, the question is, if, at what point does the violator inform the police officer that they are armed? When the police officer walks